everyone. My, my name is Kalle Sinisala. I work as a research scientist at the Natural Resources Institute Finland with the abbreviation of LUKE. Uh, and for the next 20-25 minutes I'm going to talk about the conditions of the Baltic Sea for rainbow trout and, and also for the Finnish aquaculture. Uh, quickly about the presentation, I'm going to introduce what, what we do here in, or in, in Luke, then present some numbers and, and the typical production cycle, which is a bit different than what you are dealing with, in, for example, in the Atlantic, uh, in the Finnish aquaculture perspective. Then I'm going to show some challenges and some solutions that we have come up with. Uh, but first of all, I have to say that I'm glad to be back in Iceland. Uh, I haven't been here in two and a half years, but I actually studied in Isafjörder, in the west coast. Uh, you cannot see it in the up, up left corner, but there's a picture of Iceland with Isafjörder uh, circled around. And that's my house where I stayed. And Johanna, a wonderful woman in Isafjörder, made me an excellent sweater also. Uh, about the Natural Resources Institute Finland, uh, we are kind of the main resources institute uh, with kind of uh, study going around in, in forestry, agriculture, uh, fisheries, uh, primary production and aquaculture for that sense. Uh, we are located in at least 22 locations all over Finland and this doesn't take into account for example the places which we have in the west coast of Finland where for example I, I am doing research and currently there is about 1300 people uh, working with, with Luka. Okay, but for the Finnish aquaculture uh, we have been talking about the or some people have mentioned how, how aquaculture globally has increased significantly in the past years, but the trend in Finland has been a bit different. Uh, from the late 70s till the 80s and, and to the early 90s, our production increased heavily, and I think we were one of the main, the biggest rainbow trout producers in the world in the 80s, and I don't know what happened after that. But but nowadays, when we look at, look at our trends, the, uh, trend is downwards. So, uh, from the maximum production from about 91, we have been <clears throat> the production has decreased and plateaued for the past years, and our annual production is about 14 million kilos. So, I think it's pretty close to what Iceland. Iceland has it's about a percent of what Norway has. Uh, most of our food fish production, so about 80%, uh, happens in marine environments, and, and with marine environments I mean brackish water, so the salinity at the Baltic Sea in Finland is very low, uh, so, so it's a brackish water environment, and, and from our production about 95% is rainbow trout. Um, also. Uh, our production is located kind of in two different uh, areas where the fingerling production happens in flow through systems in inland facilities and then the food fish production happens uh, at the coast and the, the red area shows that the, the food fish production which is in the west coast of, of Finland and also in the Orland Islands. Uh, a lot has happened in the past decades uh, when it comes to, to nutrients and the feed conversion ratio in, in Finnish aquaculture. We are not dealing with uh, sea lice in, in Finland. That's not a problem, problem that we have to face with, but we have another thing going on which uh, is due to eutrophication and nutrients leaking from the aquaculture sites into the uh, surrounding waters. And with better feed uh, feeding uh, habits or management, uh, better feeds and also breeding programs we have been able to lower our nominal uh, emissions, nutrient emissions of phosphorus and nitrogen to about 70% or by 70% in the past decades. But that's, that's the numbers. Now what the production 
cycle in Finland looks like. We are uh, in, in quite nor northern region and, and the thing with uh, Bal Baltic Sea is that we get some winter. The sea actually freezes during winter time and this uh, affects our production heavily. But everything starts first in inland Finland production facilities where the eggs are fertilized somewhere around New Year's and after the fish have reached a certain size to about 20 grams they are vaccinated which happens in, in spring. After that, this, the fish are then transported to marine facilities, to sheltered, sheltered locations where they are then produced for the first marine production season. And by the end of this first season, the fish reach uh, an average weight of about three to 500 grams. And in Finland, the, depending of where you're cultivating, your season stops in about September or October and then you have to haul your net cages to very sheltered areas for overwintering. So the fish stays in the net cages for winter, the uh, sea freezes and there's a ice cover surrounding the cages. And these uh, overwintering uh, areas have been uh, selected in such a way that ice doesn't move because moving ice would tear up your whole facility and you would lose all your fish. So this is one, one key point in the overwintering areas. Uh, also with the overwintering areas, uh, these locations are not prone for super cool water. And by super cool water I mean water with uh, less than zero degrees temperature. Because with super cool water, water, those can be uh, saturated with small ice particles, ice needles, and when those particles get in contact with, with the gills of the fish, it can cause very big damage and death to the fish. But then, after winter, when, when the sea free, uh, melts again, the fish are then hauled to more exposed sites for the second year. And, and after the second year, the fish typically reach a weight of about two to three kilos by the end of the season. Uh, from there, the fish are then, and the cages are uh, towed back to, to sh close to shore and close to the uh, slaughtering uh, facilities, where they are typically slaughtered from, from about August till January. So we have a very big uh, market peak or uh, supply flooding our markets in the end of the year when all the fish farmers are trying to slaughter all their fish before winter. They don't want to leave too much uh, slaughter sized fish to the cages for winter because that's a risk uh, of losing the fish during the winter time that they don't want to take. And from the slaughter the fish are then transported to markets. So this is, the production takes typically two, two years to, to complete. But some challenges. First of all, the, the seasonality that, that we have to play with. Um, Finland production, typically if you are using a domestic egg as your, your seed material, you can only get egg at a certain time. And, and all the fish from the, these inland facilities have to be restocked as early as possible, possible in, in late spring, early, early summer to these coastal facilities. And the uh, spatial or the uh, transport distance from the inland facilities to coast is quite, quite long, so it takes a lot, a lot of time and effort to get the fingerlings from the inland to the coastal sites. Uh, secondly, there is a quite short annual production period. So whether you are operating in the very north part of the coast uh, of the Finland or the southern parts of Finland, you are dealing with a production period, annual production pre period of about 21 to 30 weeks. That's the time when your fish actually grows. And we have been doing some modeling using uh, a 500 gram post smalt. Uh, that how big of an end weight that kind of fish would reach in our coastal side, uh, coastal area. So depending if you are in the north, 
you might reach uh, weights of two, two kilos or two and a half kilos, and in the southern parts and very sheltered coastal parts, you might have a fish that is uh, about or over three kilos by the end of the production uh, season. Also, uh, depending on what the summer is, we get high fluctuating temperatures, so the temp water temperature can reach up to 20, uh, 20 degrees, and during that time you have to really restrict feeding because, uh, for example, the oxygen demand of the fish increases heavily and there isn't that much uh, dissolved oxygen in the water. Uh, then, with the overwintering, uh, there's a lot of transportation going on. You have to first, uh, in spring, move your cages to one location, then uh, in, in the fall, fall, bring them back to, to certain locations and, and these overwintering areas are getting more scarce every, every year so there isn't that many places uh, for overwintering at the moment so we are, ha we are having to look to more, more exposed sites for, for these uh, overwintering locations as well and moving ice and super cold water is, is something that we have to or the farmers have to deal with every winter uh, with the seasonality, also the market peaks and the economic value that the farmers can get out of their products is, is heavily influenced by the seasons. Uh, maybe though, when it comes to uh, aquaculture in Finland, environmental restrictions and uh, when it comes to permitting and, and getting a license, that's, that's maybe one of the key issues. So. Due to the EU Water Framework Directive, um, it states that the ecological status of surface water bodies in, in member states has to be in good or high uh, status. I think it was by 2020, but they have, they have postponed it. Um, and, and what has happened is that every, any licensed practice uh, which aquaculture is in Finland cannot jeopardize or um, uh, jeopardize reaching a good status or, or maintaining a good status of surface water bodies in Finland. And um, in, in Finland, the main restricting parameters in this sense are, are the phosphorus and nitrogen loadings from agriculture sites, because that causes eutrophication and has a uh, direct impact on, on the uh, ecological status of the, of the water bodies. So, so nowadays, what we have seen in Finland is that the trend has been with new licenses being uh, granted to many RAS facilities and also to more exposed areas where the environmental impacts are less harmful. But we have discussing and, and coming up with some, some solutions how to tackle these, these issues. And uh, I think this started about 10 years ago, about the idea of recycling nutrients within the Baltic Sea when it comes to aquaculture. So, so not so long ago, um, most of the phosphorus and nitrogen that the fish meal contains was coming from um, sources outside the Baltic Sea. So for example, using uh, uh, fish meal that was using raw, uh, for example, Chilean anchovies or, or Atlantic fish as raw material. We were bringing in new nutrients to, to the Baltic Sea, which is kind of a closed water body. There's only a little water exchange going through from uh, or by the Danish Strait. So the, so the idea was to uh, stop bringing in new nutrients and recycling the nutrients that we already have. There is plenty, plenty of nutrients in the Baltic Sea at the moment. Um, and the main idea was that the mass balance of nutrients in the Baltic Sea would remain unchanged and, and the amount of nutrients that fish feed raw material uh, would uh, correspond or would have it inside of it would correspond to the nutrient emissions from aquaculture. And uh, for the past five, six years, there's been a lot of calculations going on by the Research Institute, but also other institutes in Finland about how we would calculate the 
nutrients first uh, emitted from the aquaculture sites, but also uh, the nutrients within the feed that the fish would consume. And with the recycling the nutrients with the Baltic Sea fish feed, the idea, idea is quite simple. So uh, fish in net cages, they uh, proceed or uh, make uh, feces, and, and with that there's nutrients which phytoplankton binds, uh, and the nutrients move uh, to the next trophic levels first, to the zooplankton and then to Baltic herring as prat. Uh, in Finland, uh, our local fisheries would then land the Baltic and Baltic herring and, and sprat, which would be processed first to fish meal and oil, and later on to to uh, fish feeds. And when we use this locally uh, sourced fish feed to feed our fish, when we take out the uh, fish for slaughter, we also remove some nutrients nutrients with it. Uh, however, the solution or the idea of recycling nutrients in, in this kind of way has not been totally accepted yet, not, not by all researchers or the legislative bodies. Uh, and there's one thing that hasn't really changed in the past 10 years. Uh, there's no legal status of using any kind of compensatory tool uh, in the permitting process in Finland. So what, what we are currently uh, focusing on and trying to implement is bringing some, some tools for fish farmers that they could compensate the emissions that they are, uh, uh, or their actions are causing to the environment. But since from a legislative perspective this is not, not uh, possible yet, there is really no strong incentive for the farmers to use locally sourced uh, fish feeds at the moment. However, mo most of them are still are, are using the local local feeds at the moment. But that's that's from the feed. Uh, I have few slides or few projects that we are doing at the moment to tackle the issues that we are facing. Uh, first of all. Since our production is moving to more offshore, more exposed areas, and also we want to uh, move our winter storage to more exposed area, Luca purchased a submersible fish cage a year ago. So in, in last year's August, we bought a net cage, a submersible net cage from Badinotti, and we have been testing it since. Uh, last winter, we left 500 uh, rainbow trout for several months, for three months under ice, and that really ended up with poor results, so we ended up kill it, killing all the fish. Uh, that being said, for this year we, we bought a telemetry system to be able to monitor the welfare and the behavior of the fish better. So what we did in July was that we took 10 rainbow trouts uh, we put them individually to sleep, made a small incision between the pelvic and pectoral fins, uh, and put a small uh, sensor inside the body cavity of the fish. We stitched them up, uh, left them for recover for, for six days, and then released them into the net cage with 35,000 other fish. And with these uh, sensors, we can get at the moment, individual data regarding the depth, the temperature, inside depth temperature of the fish, and also the acceleration of the fish. Uh, there's three hydrophones, hydrophones recording the uh, signals from the tags, and, and we should be able to also 3D position the, the fish inside the net cages, but, or net cage, but we haven't looked into that yet. Uh, and also, we have done one so this started in July. It's gonna this this uh, setup will will end in I think early December. But we have once submerged the cage, and, and we are planning to now look into the uh, kind of behavioral changes, what happens during the submerging of the fish, and right after we re re uh, resurface the 
the cages. So this is with offshore farming, uh, with RAS. We are looking currently uh, about how using how we could use RAS cultivated post smalt uh, in a marine environment. So the fish would be first grown in RAS for about 500 grams, and then then we are releasing them in different times um, to net cages. Um, and there's few few control groups that haven't been been in grass. They go through the, the whole process like typical fish. And what we have seen so far is that uh, fish that were stocked in marine net cages in spring, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in, in last fall, grow better than the ras or fish that were stocked in the net cages during winter or right after winter. So there is some sort of winter signal that the ras cultivated rainbow trout post smolt are missing and that causes them to grow poorly in marine environment but we really don't know what is happening yet but this is this is something that's going on at the moment um, lastly uh, one of our researcher mr tapio kiuru uh, came up with a plug and play farm solution uh, using partial RAS, and the idea was to come up with a solution that is both reliable and profitable for fish farmers. In, in Finland, typical RAS farms uh, have not been profitable if they have been used for food fish production. And I think this is not just in Finland, this is a global trend. Uh, but with this uh, new solution, which there is a, a patent pending, uh, it only requires a water connection and also uh, electricity. It uses shipping containers, so it's highly modular, and and the water movement principle within the uh, containers is based on mixed cell raceway principle. Uh, even though there is no biofilter, so this is not a RAS, this is a partial RAS. Yeah, so with even no biofilter, there is a, a reduction in the nutrient loadings uh, with the system, and this is something that is very helpful, at least in Finland. Uh, and the prototype is being tested in, in Lauka, in Jyväskylä, and, and <coughs> this is what the system, system, our system looks from above. That's shortly what... Any, any questions? Good. It's really nice presentation. I think it was, uh, it's really good. Uh, but there was one thing coming up into my mind because you know I'm from a little country called Denmark, and we also producing rainbow trout in mariculture in Brackish Water. Yeah. A little further south and uh, and west. But anyway, you know, uh, we we are actually following uh, our mariculture farms uh, in December. Yeah. And then uh, we start up again in March, April, where we stock uh, the uh, the cages with one kilogram rainbow trout, and then they grow maybe to two, three, four, or even five kilograms, and then they are harvested in November, December. And uh, this is, uh, from our point of view, a very good uh, strategy because then we have a fallowing period where we clean everything up in the environment, and you don't have any speculations. Uh, keep keeping your fish alive and so on because you have harvested, you may have sold them already. So isn't that a possibility for you as well so you don't have to look after your fish during that entire period just to make your 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 stockfish a little larger to one kilogram? Yeah, that's uh, I think the seasonality and the more northern uh, spatial look or our, our location plays a big role here because First of all, we get the natural following period during the overwintering period when we have to take the fish to more sheltered areas and, and the fish are not fed in the sense of gaining growth during winter. The water is so so uh, so cold that the fish really don't grow. They are fed a minimum amount of feed just to maintain an active bowel movement. Uh, 
when it comes to using larger mesh, uh, that would require, uh, how would I say, it would require one more year to add to the production cycle, because with our short time period being, I don't think that we can, during the first period or first production period, get our fish to that one kilogram size. So, if, if that's a, if kind of answered your question, I, I don't think that it's that possible with our short, short summers. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, I'm Jacob. I'm from uh, from Acta Group. Uh, I come from Denmark, and I used to be a farmer like uh, you guys in Finland. And I had a, a farm producing rainbow trout from springtime to Christmas, I'd say, uh, producing a thousand tons per year. Yeah. This is many years ago before I joined Acta Group, where I've been working now for 14 years. But I think, uh, Kurt, what you're missing out, maybe, the reason why we did the following is that we produced a lot of roe or caviar, you could call it. So by taking out all the fish in the autumn, we were selling a hell of a lot of roe for the Japanese market, which actually made us survive in this highly competitive business yeah. towards the salmon business, because trout and salmon is also very different in the markets. But, but we did what, what you're saying. But, uh, we took out all the fish before Christmas. We didn't have the hassle of overwintering because it's lethal. Yeah. I've lost tons of fish in the winter, so we gave that up. But we built a lot of recirculation fish farms, outdoor farms. We produced quite big rainbow smolts at seven, 800 grams. Yeah. And we spent all March and April driving our big trucks with fish. So we are both dead and alive, but the fish are still alive and we put them out into the cages and we grow them to four or five kilo. And we could say that we use the rainbow trout as the packaging for the roe. <laughs> because for us the roe was actually the gold which we are still selling to Japan. And in Japan it's a special New Year's present that people buy, where you take the roe and you put it in a salt brine and then you go to your friends and you give it to them. So that's how we at least make money in the business. <laughs> in, in the resource center we're making money, we're just spending it. <laughs> Could ask one little point more. This pairing, pairing uh, period is very important uh, from the point of diseases, actually. Because, I mean, uh, we don't have any uh, sea life problems in Denmark, also because it's uh, low salinity production. So we don't have any reproduction at the sites where we have agriculture. That's one thing. But we have other diseases. And there is a fear also of the you have VHS virus in your system. And in this way, we close down everything. Everything will be, will be removed from the system, even also if we have some sediments from, from feces and other things of the, from the farm. So, I mean, there are some advantages of thinking about this. And even, I mean, you feed your fish during the winter period, and that is also nitrogen and, and, a, uh, and phosphorus uh, contribution. So maybe you could consider it uh, and maybe just have a rust system on land, produce a small one kilogram, and then actually harvest the fish in November this way. And you get rid of many diseases this way as well, have a clean environment. But just yes. No, no, but, but using the rust, rust smalt, like you mentioned, that's, that's something we are looking into because, like I showed, uh, showed here earlier, at least at the moment, it looks like the, the for some reason, the RAS cultivated rainbow trout in our environment doesn't grow that well, but we don't know why. We would like to have a RAS facility very close to the net cages, uh, producing large smalls, which would grow that, like, fantastically in, in the marine environment. That, that's the dream. I hope we are going to do that someday. But at the moment, it's it's not yet possible. Okay, so kind of thank you.